want to understand the ending, yeah, I know it's playing the beginning, and uh, the beginning was bad, you know. My name is Fapali Taumua Tuvalu, but the fellas know me as uh, Pali. Uh, okay. The community knows down here knows me as Pali. Nice. Uh, what community are we talking about? Where do you live? Oh, I live in Orange County. Uh, I grew up in Samoa, but I came here in my 20s. Mm -hmm. So I live with family here in OC. This is where I uh, met my wife. And this is where we, we raised our kids at. So you came from Samoa in the 80s. Okay. Yeah, I was 20, you know. So I was running around out here for five years. And by 1985, I picked up a... Uh, a commitment to the system and uh i end up with a 25 to life sentence wow but so uh give me a chance that uh, before we continue you know uh, in case i forget i like to uh have this opportunity to uh to officially issue out an apology to all the people the victims that are of my life crime and anybody else that i have done harm to you know before i went to prison and during the prison and even after came out of prison and uh, I offer my sincere apologies, you know, for for all the harm I've done to you, you know, no excuses, no excuses. I've done everything I can to make amends and uh, I think, uh, you know, there will be a lifetime of making amends. You know, I'm still an alcoholic and drug addict, but I'm in the process, I've been in the process and uh, it's, uh, it's going good. So I'm able to, uh, to stay out of prison, I've been out of prison now for 10 years. So I've been able to stay out of prison, out of this process. But I sincere apologies to everyone I've harmed in, uh, in my life. You know, let me give you this opportunity to offer that. So thank you. I think that's very honorable of you. You know, one thing about going to prison, you know, it, it's either going to make you worse or make you a better man. And, uh, you know, I see you've changed your life and you know, what were some of the things while you were incarcerated that uh, helped you change your life and help you realize, you know, this isn't the type of thing I want to be living through my whole life? You know, before we get to that process, you know, the changes, let me kind of uh, explain the beginning. You know, sure. there's always a beginning, you know, because that's how, you know, to understand the ending. Yeah, I do explain the beginning, and uh, the beginning was bad, you know. For me, when I went in, in 85, I ended up in a level four, you know, the maximum level four, at least was in the old fossil. And uh, at that time, you know, if anybody know the history of that place, everyone was out running around, you know, wild in that place. And old Fossum and uh, San Quentin were the only level fours in, uh, in those days. So everybody was out, all the prison cans, the M, the AP, the, a the PGF. They were all out then, you know, they were all running around and, and these guys were not nice, you know, so, so that's how I started. I started out there and uh, I kind of like, you know, when I first went in, I already know that this is going to be a life sentence. So my first question is, how am I going to deal with it, you know? So I came to the conclusion that I shouldn't change that much, you know? I see how the people still get high in there. People still drink. There's still parties in there, you know, that kind of stuff. Say, I'm not going to adjust that much, you know. This is where I'm going to live. I'm not going to adjust that much. I'm sure I'm going to do the same thing. So that's what, exactly how it went down. So, you know, there's, you know, do the work, work out during the week and prepare to keep partying the weekend. So that's my life for a long time. It was always drinking. It was always smoking pot, you know, that kind of stuff. So. So nothing really changed that much. And they also came with the chaos that come with all that stuff. And so for the first, uh, I think uh, I'll say the first 85 to, to, for the first 18 years or 16 years, I I was in the hole three times. I done shoot turns three times. I already, you know, I was in ASIC a lot of times for investigation, and I think I have 15, already 115s by that time. That's how I ended up in High Desert. I think you showed up over there when I was there. At least that's what Pika told me, is that you were there in the, in the same building with him, but I was in the other side. I was in the other building. Right. I think you came up when uh, we were in lockdown, so I didn't get to see you, but but that was how uh, I ended up there, you know. So from that time, from the beginning, 85 to 2000 and, and when I landed in High Desert, this was all chaotic time in my life. You know, there was a lot of problems, and that's how I ended up picking up shoot terms because of all those problems. You know, and the transformation began was uh, 
was actually behind the family visit. You know, I, I am one of those lucky guys that uh, even with a life sentence, my wife stayed with me, you know. My wife and through the whole process of, you know, and uh, I, I done time far from home too, Pelican Bay, High Desert, for example, you know, full zone. So we ended up having a kid during these family visits. And then one day, you know, Wilson, the governor, decided to take the family visit. And his, the rationale behind it was that, you know, since life was, we're not going home, we're just going to, you know, take the family visit. So the problem with me was, my question was, what happened to all these kids that we had in the family visits? What's your, you know, how does the state see this situation? You know, we didn't have just have family. We became, actually became parents during this thing, during this whole process, this state, you know, sanctioned process. You know, this is a program that was sanctioned and created by the state. So we're not just prisoners anymore. We're actually parents. That's how I saw it. Mm. You know, they didn't just take the family visit. What they did was change the laws and say prisoners have no right to see their families. So this is a lot more deeper than, than just taking the family visit. You're actually taking, you're, you're terminating parental rights to these children that we had, you know, in the family visit. The only reason why we had this case was because of state created program. And so my question was, where does the constitution lie in this kind of situation? Is, uh, is there some kind of obligation the states owe to these kids, especially the kids? You didn't just take the family visit. You actually took the rights from these kids to visit their parents. You know, it's not just prison visitation. This is a parental visit. So I'm looking at it from that angle and saying, man, if the Constitution is, is, is what they say to be, then there is protection under there. So that's what changed my life. I'm like, I'm going to go to the library. I'm going to look for this thing. And that's exactly what I did. And so I start going to the library. I start quitting, you know, start getting rid of all the stuff in the yard, you know, everything else secondary then to me, you know. So I start focusing on on this case. I'm going to go do the research and, and see what happens and see what the Constitution say. And I went and looked and I looked and I looked and I found it. I said, mm-hmm. there is applications here. The Constitution does protect this. And it's under a theory called special relationship. This theory is says that, uh, that for example, Example, like an example of this theory is about medical, how the society is supposed to take care of the prisoner when he's incarcerated regarding medical care. Mm-hmm. They don't own that. The Constitution say, you know, does not say that, hey, yeah, treat these guys, give them all the treatment they deserve, the medical treatment. The Constitution say that, but once once the state takes a person away the liberty to take care of himself, the state is obligated to do this. You know, that's why we that's why they they treat it medically, medically uh, treated in prison. So under this theory. You know, it says that uh, once uh, a state creates something and you end up violating your rights, then the con- federal constitutions come in and protect you. So, so that's how that's how I came across it. You know, I'm gonna find, I'm gonna, I'm I'm, I'm gonna challenge this in court. So to challenge in court, you know, this is a whole new area. You have to do, <laughs> you have to learn how to go for about how to file a complaint, how to do. This is a big process. But I say, you know what? I'm gonna go for this you know, because. As a parent, I feel like, uh, you know, this is a duty, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, this is a duty now, you know, right. to protect you. It's not a family visit, but it's protect the visiting rights of this kid that I had. And so I began by, right then, they start bringing vocation packs. And there was a, a computer office uh, vocation saying, you know, I'm going to go take this. I had to learn how to type. <laughs> so I started putting a plan together, you know. And so I went there. Start learning how to type and learn how to type. So I got a typewriter, you know, man, you know, to start putting the plan together. That was the first place this guy went for, you know. So as I did the research, I happened to come across then a case that nobody, I didn't hear of it. It wasn't in the news. Nobody was talking about it. It's a case called Rosencrantz, you know, Henry Rosencrantz. This is the first case that began a whole process why, why life was ended up getting released from prison. Was mm-hmm. this case called Henry Rosengrant. So the case was, uh, the, the court was saying that if you create this law, you know, you have to follow this law. There is no, no way around it because the, the law, the parole law say you do this, this, and this, then you're entitled to be released back to society. But Wilson came in with their parole board and say, nah, they, nobody has a right to parole. Once you commit a crime, you die in prison. Right. And so when I read this case, right away I read it, I understood because I understood yeah, what's gonna what's coming because that's exactly the area where I'm using the area of the law that I'm using to file the family visit case to challenge the family visit decision under. Hmm. So this called a special relationship case. So I understood right away. 
You know what I'm saying, man? I'm going home. People don't realize then, but this was in uh, uh, 2001, I think. I, I came across the case in 2000, yeah, 2001, when I was in Lancaster. So I said, you know what? We're going home. Wow. People don't say, but we're going home, man. And then I went on one. So I ended up in a high desert. I was scheduled for parole. So, so a week, I think a month, yeah, about a month before I went to parole, I got my last 115 assistant. I had it, I got into the cop and uh, and uh, they wrote me up. And so I went to the to the parole board. And the parole board they're like look at me and I say, man, and they straight up say, you know, everyone that came with you, you know, you're I think by then I was 40 some years old. They say you're 40 years old. You know, everyone that like, came with you I already lived with you know, threes, you know, it's been there for a long time. But here you are, you know, a month before you come to the pro boy, you get a 115. They, you know, what makes you think you're coming home? Because so far we look at your record, you're like you're like a retard. <laughs> That's what they told me. <laughs> like you're retarded, you know. You know, you shouldn't be here, but you know, I'm not you're here asking us to release you for what? You know, you haven't followed any regulations. You have so many disciplinary, you know, there's no reason why you should be here. So, so I took it as very, I took it hard, you know, I took it hard from that day and say, you know, you know, they are correct. The challenge is, you know, why am I doing all this stuff? I'm, I'm following the same pattern I did in the street. Nothing has changed in my life. So then it became a challenge for me. I say, in order to change, in order to go home, you know, everybody's going home. I already knew then every, you know, I already knew the law, then everybody's going home. So I'm saying, you know, you suspect everybody's going home, then it's time to work for it. How do you get home? And then it began a transformation, you know? So, and then I actually ended up doing some real prison time from that time forward, man. It was hard. It was harder than before. Right. <laughs> it was harder than before. It was, you know, I have... I have said myself, you know, I have said this, people expected me to be this kind of person from my life in prison. And then they meet me and say, you know, there's something needs to change, something's different here. Now, when I got out, people still call, call me and say, man, how'd you do it? How'd you get out? Because they know me from before, you know, I wasn't, you know, they didn't expect me to be, be one of the first people to be released. <laughs> but I got out because I had, I already set a plan up in play, you know what I'm saying? And this is uh, really what got me out was, uh, you know, from that parole board, the next parole board, no 115. It was like four years later, the next parole board, no 115. And they go, what happened? Why all of a sudden you changed? You know, I didn't, I didn't answer it then, you know. I didn't really know the answer. So the next parole board, no 115. And it's still not answer. Then they answered the, the, the board member asked the same question. What changed about you? Why all of a sudden, no one, all of a sudden you stop? What changes? And that's when I knew. That's when I suspect that the answer to this question is going to release me. <laughs> it's going to get me released from prison, you know? So, so I say, you know what? I think I know the answer, but I'm going to wait. Answer that, you know, wait till the right time, you know, and then the right board, you know? So I just got to keep working, keep developing mm -hmm. my stuff back here, preparing myself for the street. And so the answer was, it's about, you know, I go to the board, we all go to the parole board and we tell the board, oh, sorry for what I did. And, um, you know, I'm never going to do it again. The act is telling people how remorseful you are. The problem is, how do you demonstrate remorse? That's the hardest thing, you know, to me back then. How do you actually demonstrate remorse without, you know, it's telling people, oh, I'm remorseful for what I've done. But you have to show somehow, at least for me, you have to show how you demonstrate remorse. But that was the answer. That is exactly how I, I explained it, you know, in my last parole hearing, you know, the, the reason why, because they asked the same question. I went five times and four times they asked the same question. What changes? What changed you? Why you all of a sudden you stop getting 115s? And I'm saying, you know, it's just, you know, this is how I, I wanted to, I can say it, I'm remorseful for what I've done. But the only way I can do it, one can do it, is by following the law. This is what holds us all together. Mm -hmm. You're most of by following regulation rules, no matter how small the rules are, you follow it by following re, uh, uh, rules. This is how you demonstrate the most in real life is by following, you know, acceptable standards of behavior. Was how I, 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 I didn't say it like that, but that's how I was thinking, you know. And it's how you demonstrate remorse. 
but that's how uh, that's how I end up, you know, coming home was answering that question, at least for me. Right. Well, uh, that's a little bit uh, of uh, outline to answer that question of uh, of those changes that that uh, that came through why I end up here. Yeah. So having a child within the prison and then eventually going to the law library to fight for your visitation. Man, that just really changed everything. Your whole perspective on the way you've been living your life in there. That's Change awesome. Change yeah. So yeah, and that's actually what began the process was that, you know, right. was when, uh, you know, it was more like a, it was a godsend for me that they took this thing. You see, I ended up, you know, I ended up becoming what I was when I was a kid, you know, searching for knowledge, that kind of stuff. You know, there were really a couple of cases filed about these cases and it was already rejected by the court. Not my case. I filed in federal court and a judge said they violated my rights. <laughs> so wow. This I was the first case, you know, this is from a, an amateur, you know, I, I, I had never done this before, you know, my first run. And that's what the judge found, that they violated my right as a parent. My problem was because I had let, I went as far as uh, do discovery, but my lack of, uh, you know, my lack of knowledge in the law and up dismissing the case because I just couldn't move it forward, you know, my lack of experience, you know. But that is one thing I take, I get from that because the court did find that, you know, that they violated my rights. Anyways, mm -hmm. I went through the process, appeal all the way to the United States Supreme Court, that kind of stuff. But it was an experience. It was beauty. I didn't realize it then, but this, the setup that was coming, you know, so I was, I was playing that in another question if I can, you know, but there was a setup coming and it began from here. Mm. Man, so um, how long did you end up serving before being released? 28, 28 years. I yeah. I did like, I did uh, 21 level four and, and then the next three level three and then level two and I came home. Wow, 21 on the level four. So you really did wait to the last <laughs> few years. Before you turned it all around. Wow. That's what shocked everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I Some see. Some of these guys were in level three. Some of these fools were like in level three for like 15 years. And I come <laughs> level three, level two, and I was gone, you know. Wow. Like, uh, I've later. Yeah. So they, they call me and ask, hey, you know, I don't know how I did it. I say, man, you guys see me. I don't, I spend time in, out in the yard, but you know, play basketball, do a little exercise, but my, all my days in the law library. Mm -hmm. And that's like, you know, you know, a lot over ten years. Because this case, I fought this case for like ten years or something. You know, so it became like a. This is my anchor, my daily anchor. You know, just make sure that I don't screw it up. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah, and they were surprised, they were shocked. You know, that yeah. I came, but that was the plan was there. You know, by by reading, by finding the case, I actually start reading about what the courts wants from you, how mm -hmm. the courts interpret the law. You know, so you set a program following how the courts interpret the law, you know, so that's what I did, you know, right? and it worked out for me, you know. Man, well, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. And the whole time you were going well, through all this, you had a family background where they were still sticking with you and going through all of this with you. Man, that's, that's a, a beautiful thing. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful thing. Well, you see, they were the anchor. I, I survived. I actually, you know, the truth. You know, I wouldn't make it out of the prison if if, if uh, I would have died in there. Mm. That's the truth. You know, I, there are some people in there, you meet in there, they just plain evil, man. Yeah. <laughs> it makes end cards, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You know, most of the cards are good, but there are some in there that just play there, there just to be evil, man. Yeah. But that's the yeah. truth. Yeah, I really, I really feel that because um, the same thing for me, I wasn't there as long as you were. I was there for about 10 years and uh, I had my family with me the whole time. And I feel like if I didn't have that family support, I would have gotten in a lot more trouble. Well, I'm happy that you were able yeah. to find a, a, a reason to live and a reason to to get out of there. You know, and that's a beautiful thing. And you did that. So we got you on here to talk about your uh, book release. Congratulations on that. Thank you. So the whole thing with you going through prison and everything, is that something that may have inspired you to write this book? Um, tell me a little more about it. Well, first, you know, as a kid, I grew up in Samoa. So, you know, as a kid, you know, this is my dream was to be published. 
you know, as a kid. I was always a reader, you know, when I was a child in Samoa. This is how I see the world. This is how I visit the world, you know, was through readings, you know. I learned about the Vietnam War, you know, uh, through Time magazines in the public library in Samoa. So, you know, this is how I visit the world, you know, was through reading books. So, uh, so I had an experience in high school where, you know, I was... I was I was a screw up in high school, but I I had this sometimes I had this burst of energy in writing, you know. So and so one day, you know, I we had an assignment and I wrote an essay. I I still remember the essay. It was just something like an out of this world experience. So I wrote an essay. An essay was about a fishing a uh, fishing wharf, you know, and uh, hmm. and a teacher. My teacher was like, you know, he was really shocked when I submitted the essay. And he ended up reading the class, and and uh, and I it was a, a proud moment for me. So, and he ended up reading the class, and he congratulated and said, "Man, you are very, very good. You know, I wish you concentrate more, but you're very, very good." So, that was my the only experience I remember from <laughs> from so besides rugby. You know, <laughs> winning winning rugby only experience I had uh, that. Uh, that I remember from high school, and, and it was there that my dream then became that I want to be published. You know, one of these days I want to write a book. So in prison, I had this, still had the same dream. You know, I carried the same dream. I want to be published, and I got very got influenced by some writers like uh, uh, Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand's uh, Atlas Shrugged. Uh, I don't know if you ever read that book. It's a really good book. It's anti-religion, anti-God. It inspired me because. Uh, so it's, uh, it talks about, you know, about your value, how you value yourself, you know, how, you know, you don't value yourself according to what other values you, that kind of stuff. It's, 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 a, it's a really good book to, uh, to read. So that inspired me. So that was one of my first inspiration and in, also one of my first inspiration and influence in the book, in the, in the, in the, in the system. And one the other one is, uh, it's a book everybody, I don't know if you read it, Les Miserables, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, Les Miserable, I think the best, the English way. And that was, uh, it was very, very, uh, a very good book. This book shows how, how individual, how you can influence society. You know, this book influences the French society. Now they started, you know, providing, treating uh, the lower class much better, I believe. You know, start seeing in the, Reveal the, the justice system that has done a lot of harm to the bottom of it and that led to the revolution, the, the French Revolution. So, these two books was very influential, you know, in my thinking process that, that you know, if you can contribute to society, you know, especially if somebody has committed a crime, you know, that would be worth a shot at it, you know. So, my problem was I didn't know what kind of book I'm looking for. You know, I'm not a good writer. I, uh, I didn't have the education to to write these kind of books. You know, you can do characters, yeah, but to present a message, that's a different, that's a whole different write out in the message. And, you know, because that's what the book is. You're giving a message, somehow writing a coded conversation and that kind of stuff. But so my problem was that. So one time I, I, you know, I sat down, with a got a typewriter, you know, during the lockdown, hi, there's it. So I wrote. I said, no, let me practice writing something. So I wrote up a script and I passed it around the fellas and, and it surprised me. Like every little fellas said, man, you know, did you actually write this? I said, yeah, I wrote it. I said, no, man, you got to tell me. You got to finish this book, man. You got to finish it. I want to see the ending. And this was, you know, it was really surprising to me, you know. So I even gave a copy. That's one of the things I did too. You know, how you pile your file up. I, I wrote, I gave a copy to the council. The council read it and the same thing reaction. Say, like, gee, you actually read this, you know? I mean, did you actually write this? And say, yeah, why? You know, I understand why because I'm a fop, you know? I, I don't speak this kind of, you know, the, my writing is different from, from speaking. So I say, yeah, I wrote it. So I say, I want it in my file. I say, why? I say, because I want pro to see that even though I'm all this, you know, there's up here still alive, man. I, I just gotta recharge it, you know. I just gotta, you know, I just gotta project it and recharge it. Is that alive? Is all right? I put it in there, so I start doing those uh, little stuff. I start doing the writing, you know, and uh, and then the idea is still in my mind, and I want to write a book, but I just didn't know what kind of book. So I came down to level three, you know. All these years, twenty-one years, I was in level four. Now the conversation is different. Hmm. You know, it's different. It's about trying to go home. You know? Yeah. <laughs> trying to figure out how to go home plans, 
for the future for life. This is what life is do. You know, what are you going to do? You know, so everybody got plans. <laughs> but these plans, most, you know, doesn't even, you know, there's some people, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy some dope, do some dope. But, you know, most plans do not involve robbery and burglary and, you know, that kind of stuff. So I come down to level two, the short timers, they have a whole different game, man, a whole different plan, a whole different outlook in life. You know, it's just short timers. They're just running in, running out, running in. And that's why they talk. I hear the conversation. They're talking about, you know, robbing people and they rob this, burglarize this house. I'm like, man. This is a whole different world I'm facing. I'm, I'm looking at it and say, man, my, my kids live in this world. My family lives in this world. Mm. You know, and these kids are talking this kind of stuff. This is scary, scary stuff I'm listening to. So that's when the plans start coming to shape. You know, I say, man, I think I know, I think I got an idea of the kind of book. So by the time I, uh, by the time I got level two, I was getting ready to, to come home. And then, uh, and then uh, I finally said, you know what? I think I know the book I'm going to write. I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to find 10 scientific facts that prove that God is true. The God the Jews came brought to us was, was real. And, and and the reason my motivation was, man, you know, the truth is, I say, man, even if you listen to this kid's conversation, even if God is not true, we have to make one up, man. So <laughs> and nothing scared this kid, man, nothing. Yeah. You know, this kids, that's all, these are animals. I'm listening to the conversation, my like, God, these people, these are, this is scary stuff, man. These kids yeah. have no remorse, nothing, nothing. No harming people is a standard of value. Like, this is how you get your, your street grads, you know, you hurt mm -hmm. other people, you know, rob them, kill them, you know, yeah, that's all they're looking for. So in my mind, I'm like, man, I don't know what kind of world we're, we're you know, we don't even need, you know, we know. <laughs> We don't need the devil, man. The devil, the devil is here amongst us. You know, we are yeah. devils, man. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So, so that's when the general <laughs> idea came, came in and say, man, I'm going to find 10 scientific facts that can be proven scientifically that God is real. Mm. And so that's how I came about with uh, the concept of the book. And then I, I, I'm going to share this experience. I know it's going to sound weird <laughs> too. It's going to sound really but I have to share this because this book I came to conclude was a result was, was a result of this event. All right, so you know preparation for for the parole board is really really tough. I mean it's tough. It's a stressful stressful for years. You just prepare for this. You go to site. You get programs. <laughs> you ignore other foods. You know you know intervening with your program so you know so you have to be patient so it's a stressful yeah. it's an anxiety you know and then you're thinking oh man this guy's you know you got all this waste of time you go there and he's gonna say no nah, we'll wait for you you know a couple <laughs> more years you'll be all right <laughs> so so i had this preparation you know so the night that uh i talked to my wife on the phone and the night before the, the hearing and my wife goes hey did you memorize your scripture you know I already memorized my script, but, you know, my wife was always checking me, you know, did you memorize your script like I told you? <laughs> I said, what? I don't need no script, though. We got into an argument, and so, but the script that was, uh, was Psalm 23, you know, so I already memorized a bit of it, but after that argument, so I went and memorized it, fully memorized the thing, prepared, you know, for, <laughs> so I went in the hearing that morning, so I went, I... I went in the cell, I laid down, and I remember the argument. I say, uh, I was already stressing, you know. I was I was anxiety, stopped pacing back and forth in the cell, and then I sat down and said my prayer and then recited the Psalm 23, you know. So after that, oh I felt better. It's I like I just felt better. Like it was confidence there, you know. And so a little bit, no the, the the, the car came and he said, man, let's go. We're ready. So we walked over. It's only like 10 steps from the cell to the door. And then this is where it happened. So open the door and I walk. My first step as I step over the door, the inside to the room, that step, I felt this sensation in my body, like everything just fell off. Like, you know, I didn't know what it was. Hmm. Later on, I, I thought this is what you call peace. This is what uh, defined peace. There's peace. 
Mm. I think this is, I later on was thinking, this must have been one, what, it, what it feels like when you die. Like there was nothing. This is on a step. Like by the time that step landed, it was done. The experiment was done. Wow. But that's what it felt like. Felt like this must have been what later on I, I looked at. It must have been what is it like when you die, like everything just fell out of your body. No feeling, no sensation, no stress, no nothing. Just empty. That's exactly how I felt. It's just the body was just empty. It felt like that's that's why I came to conclude. It must have been like when you die, that your, your body just let go. You know. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, I stepped over the door, and it was done. And this is the weirdest part, right? I looked up, and I seen there was two commissioners. One was uh, the regular one was uh, you know the marine haircut, the most likely an ex police chief from somewhere. A uh, little marine haircut, and the other one though was different. This guy was bending down, writing, and he had long hair to his shoulders. And the first thing that came in my, jeez, that guy looked like Jesus because of the hair, you know. It turned out this was uh, this was a new class of new poor poor commissioners, and this guy was uh, I think a Turkish uh, a guy from Turkey. And that's what uh, I say. Oh. So, but I knew right then, you know, right then and there that that the hair was done. That I was going home. Hmm. So it was this uh this was the experience that uh that I came after I, I after I wrote a book and I went through the first edit and then I remember this experience and I say this was how this book came about was from this experience from this because I'm not this book should not been written by somebody like me. There are better people who could have, who have found the stuff that I that I discuss in the book, you know. The only thing I can claim that I found are biblical icons is, I found, I, I, I'm describing the, the identity of the tree of knowledge, the garden of Eden, the tree of life, and the ark of the covenant. But the only, I didn't discover, the only thing I can say I discovered was uh, the tree of life, because it's a little bit different, you know. I had to come through the scientist discoveries and, and theory that explain the meaning of the tree of life. But the other ones, the scientists discovered them. The tree of knowledge, it looks, it looks just like a tree, just like a tree, and and uh, and uh, I, I'm leaving those for the for for the audience, you know, to discover in the book. Of course, the Ark of the Covenant, though, I describe in the videos, so it's on there. They can go on the videos on YouTube and uh, and, and uh, Okay, so are you going to be continuing to speak about the book on your YouTube channel, or you're going to be using other platforms? I have a, a website that's about to become online when uh. When uh when I get the links for the for the books to be published, so that's about to come online. So I'm gonna do some blogging there. There's gonna be some YouTube videos as well. I uploaded ten in there, and the next one will be to just to update everyone anticipating the the release of the book. But nice. I really really hope uh I'm really alone that uh you know get to read this book. If you're looking at God like when I, I was writing this thing, and then I the first the second edit. That's when I finally realized where I got this information from. You know, it's from that meeting in that boardroom. You know, mm. and then uh, you know, sometimes I was reading, I start crying. Like how God designed it. it's beautiful, bro. It's absolutely you'd be stunned how easy He made it. Yeah, very interesting subject. So I'm gonna have to read the book and then have you back on so we can talk about it a little more. Yeah, that would be good, man. That would be good, man. You have to read this book, Goose. Yeah, I have read this book. Uh, when is it being released? Um, by mid July. By mid July, okay. you know. Okay, okay. Well, we're looking forward <laughs> to the release of the book. Um, is there anything else you would like to share? You know, before we close up, any final thoughts or reflections? Oh, can I give a shout out to the fellas still locked up? Yeah, screw of course. Up. Uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, Lozo Nut, uh, Lozo Pusa, uh, you know. You guys got to come home, man. You got to do what you need to do to get home. You know, everybody's out. You know, you got to quit screwing around and do what you need to do to come home. Mm. And, uh, and those are two from OC, you know. You guys got to come home, man. You know, that's, you know, got to find God. At least be part of that in your in your journey. Everybody got out. I know you guys won't do it again. I know it's community safe. You're not a threat no more to society. So shout out to you guys. You guys take care. Yeah, man. All right, Us. Thank you very much for having me on, Us. Hey, thank you for coming you. on. Yeah. It's, it's a pleasure. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah. And... All right, Us. Yep. Yep. Bye. Bye.